Hi, my name is Frank Rodriguez, and I'm the founder and chairman of Corporate Creations. I've been asked by the Florida Bar to present this brief video to assist members of the Florida Bar in setting up their own corporate entities for the practice of law, either uh, as sole proprietors, without any other partners, or in combination with other attorneys that uh, you want to practice law with. On the Florida Bar website, there is a member benefits section that provides benefits uh, in being a member of the Florida Bar. And one of those member benefits is free incorporation services for your entity, for the practice of law, if you are a member of the Florida Bar. And if you go to the Florida Bar website, you can see a link to this member benefit for free incorporation service. And this service is provided by the company that I founded in 1993, Corporate Creations. During my brief presentation today, I'm going to cover the five entities or business structures that are permitted under the rules regulating the Florida Bar for the practice of law. And I'm going to list those five structures for you, and then I will go over each of them one at a time, uh, describe them, and uh, provide you with a summary of which ones will be more beneficial depending on your situation. The five structures are as follows. Sole proprietorship, general partnership, limited liability partnership, professional association, and professional limited liability company. All five of those structures are permitted under the rules regulating the Florida Bar. And I'll point out that a limited partnership, which is different than an LLP, is not permitted for the practice of law. So let's start off with sole proprietorship. And let me define what a sole proprietorship is. A sole proprietorship is a business set up for the practice of law that has not incorporated and where there is only one owner. So if you start your own law practice and you do not file any document with the state, the law considers you to be running your law practice in the form of a sole proprietor. One of the drawbacks to operating your business in the form of a sole proprietor is that if you have any employees within your law practice, you have complete liability for the conduct of your employees. So for example, if you have an assistant and that assistant gets into a car accident on the way to deliver a FedEx package to the court, uh, that person is operating under the scope of your employment and that car accident will result in a liability against you personally and by operating as a sole proprietorship, you have no protection against the kinds of liabilities and risks that, that exist uh, out in the world. Uh, I highly recommend against operating your law practice in the form of a sole proprietorship. And now you know if you've already started your law practice and if you have not filed the registration of an entity with the state, the law considers you to have a sole proprietorship. Now I'm going to cover the structure called a general partnership. A general partnership is a business set up for the practice of law that has two or more owners. Those owners are commonly called partners. So if you are in the practice of law with anyone else and that person shares in the profits of the law practice, then you have a general partnership under state law. In a general partnership, you do not need to file any document with the state. The mere existence of a law firm that has not registered any document with the state where there are two or more owners constitutes a general partnership. Remember that I recommended against running your law practice in the form of a sole proprietorship, and that advice goes doubly so for a general partnership. In a general partnership, each partner has joint and several liability for all of the liabilities of the partnership. So for example, if you own 90% of your general partnership law firm and your partner owns 10%, and anyone within the law firm or if anyone who is your partner uh, commits malpractice, then the liability can be imposed entirely on you regardless of the percentage of the law practice that you own. So it is extraordinarily risky to operate 
any business of any kind, including a law practice, using the form of a general partnership. Let's talk now about LLP, Limited Liability Partnership. Many years ago, there was a, a major accounting firm in the United States that was structured as a general partnership. And one of the audit partners in that accounting firm uh, was accused of committing malpractice. Uh, that resulted in a major lawsuit against the partnership. And every single partner in that accounting firm ended up having to either personally declare bankruptcy or had to dig into their own savings in order to pay a portion of the liability, even though many of them did not know the partner who had been accused of the malpractice. As a result of that major accounting firm having this financial problem, the legislatures around the country started passing laws permitting the establishment of a limited liability partnership in order to insulate partners in what was otherwise a general partnership structure. So it is now possible for you and one other person or you and multiple partners to file a partnership registration statement with the state of Florida that officially recognizes your law firm as a general partnership and then you simultaneously file what is called a statement of qualification and by filing the statement of qualification you convert your general partnership into a limited liability partnership which commonly ends in the letters LLP and by doing so you are no longer jointly and severally liable for the liabilities of the business structure. Uh, it is uh, an improvement over the general partnership because you are now protected from personal liability for the risks associated with the law firm. And the only risk that you can never protect yourself against under any of the business structures that I am describing today is your own personal malpractice. So the formation of an entity protects you against the conduct of other people. It protects you against the conduct of your partners and it protects you against the conduct of your employees and any contractors you do business with, but it does not protect you against your own personal malpractice or your own conduct. So the only way to protect yourself against your own conduct or your own malpractice is by having insurance. So I highly recommend that even if you practice law in the form of an LLP, that your firm seriously consider having an insurance company provide you with malpractice insurance. Now I'm going to cover the fourth type of business structure, and that is a professional association. A professional association is essentially a corporation that is used for the practice of a profession. And the practice of law is considered the practice of a profession. The ending of a entity that is set up as a professional association is typically the letter P and the letter A, standing for professional association. And again, a professional association is a corporation governed by Chapter 621, which governs professional associations, but also governed by Chapter 607, which governs corporations in general. By forming a professional association, you protect yourself against the conduct of anyone else who is a shareholder within the professional association, what otherwise would be called a partner if you were in an LLP context. And the professional association also protects you against the conduct of employees of the law firm. One of the things that you can do with a professional association that you cannot do with an LLP is you can choose to have your professional association taxed as either a C corporation or as an S corporation. The default is a C corporation. So if you follow articles of incorporation and you include the provision stating that your corporation is going to be used for the practice of law, uh, that puts the entity under the professional association provisions. And you then have the ability to file what is called form 2553, which allows you to make the S corporation election for your professional association. So if you do not file form 2553 with the IRS, then you have what is considered 
a C corporation for tax purposes, and you would file Form 1120 with the Internal Revenue Service at the end of every tax year. And if you do file Form 2553, it's a very simple one-page form that informs the Internal Revenue Service that you and your colleagues, or you alone, because it is possible for you to be 100% owner of your professional association, that the owner or owners of the PA have made the decision that they want to be taxed as an S corporation. With an S corporation, there is only one level of tax at the shareholder level. The entity becomes a pass-through entity for tax purposes. There is no taxation at the corporate level when you have the S corporation election. And one of the benefits of making the S corporation election is you can engage in a tax strategy that is called wage reduction. And wage reduction is a legal way to reduce the amount of money that you pay in Social Security and Medicare tax. The combined rate in the United States for Social Security and Medicare tax is 15.3%. 12.4% of that is Social Security. And the balance, 2.9%, is for Medicare tax. And this is a payroll tax. Everyone in the United States who receives income in the form of compensation for services provided is required to pay this tax. And one of the nice things about making the S corporation election is you have the ability to pay yourself a lower amount in pay and pay yourself a profit distribution. And under US tax law, profit distributions paid to owners of an S corporation are exempt from Social Security tax. So for example, if you reduce your total pay and you are the only owner of the corporation in the example that I'm giving, and you reduce your total pay by $10,000, you would save about $1,530. So I multiplied the 10,000 by the 15.3% tax that you save by reducing your pay from whatever you're paying yourself to some number that is $10,000 lower. Now, the logical limit to this is that you pay yourself compensation of zero, and I highly recommend against that course of action because the Internal Revenue Service has the right to argue that you were paid unreasonably low compensation, and the Internal Revenue Service will make the effort to recharacterize the profit distribution as really being pay in disguise. As long as you use discretion and judgment and rely on the advice of your tax counselor, you will be able to successfully implement the wage reduction tax strategy in compliance with IRS regulations and at the same time save some money on Social Security and Medicare tax. And always remember that when you start your law practice, the faster you can develop positive cash flow, the faster you will have financial stability and the more you can practice on building your law firm. The final type of business structure that I will discuss today is called a professional limited liability company. A professional limited liability company is governed by chapters 621 and chapter 605 of the Florida statutes. And a professional limited liability company is formed by filing articles of organization with the state much like a professional association is formed by filing articles of incorporation with the state. When you file articles of organization with the state to form your professional limited liability company, you have essentially created an entity that can choose its tax attribute. So there are only four ways that business structures can be taxed in the United States. As a disregarded entity, as a partnership, as an S corporation, or as a C corporation. A professional limited liability company is the only business structure that exists in the United States that allows you to select any of those four tax schemes for purposes of running your law practice. And so in my view, the most flexible and most beneficial way to structure your law practice is a professional limited liability company. Do not make the mistake of using the letters LLC as the name ending of your law firm. 
If you do that, you will be violating Chapter 621. The Florida Secretary of State does not police against this mistake, and you will create reputational risk for yourself because anyone who understands the law will conclude that you do not understand the law, and that will not be good for your career. So make sure that if you are practicing law and you decide to form a professional limited liability company, that the name of your firm end in the letters PLLC so that you are in compliance with Chapter 621, which governs both professional associations and professional limited liability companies. If you choose to have your PLLC taxable as an S-corporation, and remember that you can choose to do that with either a PA or a PLLC, you would then file Form 2553 so that your PLLC will be taxable as an S-corporation. And once you've done that, the tax return that you would file for your PLLC is Form 1120 S. So any entity taxable as a C corporation follows Form 1120, and any entity that is taxable as an S corporation files Form 1120S. That is the Internal Revenue Service form, and those forms are due after the end of the tax year, and they're generally due by March 15th, so one month earlier than your personal tax return of April 15th. With a professional limited liability company, you can have an entity of entities. So you could, for example, have a professional limited liability company taxable as a partnership, which would mean it would file Form 1065, and then each of the individual partners within the PLLC could choose to have their own tax structure. So you could have a professional limited liability company that is owned by another professional limited liability company that chooses to be taxed as an S-Corp, and you may have another partner who may choose to have their PLLC, which owns the main PLLC, taxable as a C-Corporation. Uh, there are some situations where it would be beneficial to be taxable as a C-Corporation instead of an S if you have very high health expenses that are not covered by insurance, or if you have very high health insurance premiums. And the reason for that is that in a C corporation, you can deduct 100% of health insurance expenses and uh, health insurance premiums. Whereas in an S corporation, there are certain limitations in that deductibility. In the final analysis, unless you have higher than usual health expenses, you will generally benefit by operating your law practice with a professional association taxable as an S corporation, if you choose to go that route, or if you choose to go the route that I recommend, professional limited liability company taxable either as a partnership, if you want each of the owning entities to choose their own tax structure, or as a S corporation itself, if you're only going to have a one entity structure. Remember that at the Florida Bar website, when you look up member benefits, you will find a member benefit of 100% free basic incorporation services for the formation of any entity that you choose to form. If you are a member of the Florida Bar and if you form the entity for the practice of law, and that is a service provided by Corporate Creations, which is a firm that I started in 1993, and is now the third largest registered agent company in the United States. We consider lawyers at law firms and lawyers and legal departments of corporations to be our clients. We are here to serve the Florida Bar community that has been very loyal to us over the last 23 years of business. I hope this information has been helpful. If you go to corporatecreations.com, you will see an article called Starting Your Own Law Practice that we provide as a service to members of the Florida Bar, that information is provided free of charge, and I encourage you to visit that website in order to refresh your memory on some of the points that I have covered during my brief remarks today. I wish you success in your career, and I'm available to answer any questions from any member of the Florida Bar as a favor, as my way of saying thank you.